Hello and welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, an Oklahoma rancher and farmer. Les Feldick has been teaching homestyle Bible classes for over 20 years in Iowa, Oklahoma, and Texas. Les Feldick's unique style of Bible teaching has made the books of the Bible come to life. When Les is teaching, it's so interesting that people say time just seems to fly by. And now, here is Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody in again this afternoon. And for those of you watching on television, I think most of you are aware now that we produce four programs in succession. And uh, we just like to welcome every one of you into, in the studio here, as, uh, as well as our television audience. And again, we always like to remind folks that all of our past programs are available on video and uh, the printed page, audios, and if you're interested in any of these materials, we don't push them as a money-making scheme whatsoever, but if you're interested in any of this, you call us on our 800 number or drop us a note and uh, we'll get this information to you. We have a list that shows the subject matter of all the last eight years of television. Is that what it is, honey? And uh, it's gone so fast, but anyway, uh, it is all available, and uh, you call us and let us know if we can help you in any way. All right, I guess uh, we're getting ready to get right back into the book where we left off in our last taping or our last program. Now, when these people see this daily, of course, it's not a month ago for them. But uh, for those of you in the studio, it was a month ago when we left off in Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to pick up, as Roy's already got it on the board, Ephesians 2, verse 11. And uh, now again, Paul is going to use that word that is almost one of his favorites, and it's wherefore. And the first thing I always point out, that when Paul uses that word wherefore, it's a flashback of what he has just covered. And uh, he repeats himself, not as much as I do, but just about. And so what he is referring to is what he has just covered in these earlier verses of chapter 2, which deals primarily with the whole concept that we become new persons in Christ, we become a new creation, not by virtue of anything we have done, but all by faith plus nothing. And I know that rankles a lot of people because they still are under the impression you've got to do this, you've got to do that. But if they would just study Paul's emphasis, emphasis is the word I want to use, if they would just look at Paul's emphasis of how we enter into that salvation experience, it's not by what we do, it's by believing what Christ has already done. And so in these previous verses he says that by grace, dropping down just to take a quick review, verse 8, for by grace are you saved through faith. See, and there's nothing else listed in there. It's just our faith and made possible by the grace of God, and that it's not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. And then he goes on to say why we are then as believers to serve, because after all, God didn't just save us as a fire escape, as I've put it so often. He saved us to serve him while we're here on earth and in this earthly pilgrimage. All right, now then he comes into verse 11, and I imagine these are a couple of verses, unless they've heard me teach it, they're almost unknown to most church people, Bible students or whatever, and yet these are, are two verses or three that, that have made such an impact, at least on me, because I was just like everybody else. I, I just saw the whole thing thrown into a bucket, you know, and mixed up and parceled out until I started teaching and began to realize that God was dealing with Israel on covenant ground, and then when Israel rejected the Messiah and everything, and he turned to the Gentiles, through the Apostle Paul, and then that's when these verses became so important to me, and I've used them a lot in the past programs. I, I'm sure a lot of people will recognize this, but since it's in the verse by verse now, why well, we're going to hit it again. And he says, Wherefore remember that you being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, now, immediately that reminds us then to whom is the apostle writing? Well, he's writing to Gentiles, us. That's what I don't think we have any Jewish people in here that I'm aware of. But he's writing primarily to Gentile people. Now, whenever I teach this, this fact of Gentiles, 
being so completely different than anything that had gone before, you want to remember that at the time that God called Abraham, and we'll probably refer to this before the afternoon is over again, that when God called Abraham, every last human being on the face of the earth was pagan idolaters who knew nothing of the one true God. Not a soul. And that's when God appeared to Abraham and pulled out then the, the Jewish race or the uh, nation of Israel. But the rest of the world, we lump into the category of Gentile. Now, a lot of people, I think, got the idea that Gentiles are the Caucasians and that uh, the Orientals and the blacks and the various other races are something else. But scripturally, you see, we now lump everyone who is not of the 12 tribes and the uh, beginning of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, anyone who is not in that category is a Gentile whether they be black or white or whatever. Then the scripture also refers to them, as we see here in verse 11, as the uncircumcision. And now let's read it. Wherefore remember that you being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, that is by virtue of our genetic background in our birth, who are called uncircumcision, by those who are called the circumcision in the flesh made by hand. Now the only reason I'm going to take the time to do this, believe it or not, <clears throat> I've had people tell me, well, I've mentioned some of this that you teach to my pastor or Sunday school teacher and they'll just say, well, circumcision doesn't mean anything so far as one group of people. It was just a matter of the surgical process of the flesh. And that doesn't mean anything. Well, I beg to differ. Now come back with me, if you will, then, to Acts chapter 10. And I'm going to do this just to show that <clears throat> when the Bible refers to the uncircumcised, it's Gentiles. When it refers to the circumcision, it's Israel. And right here in a few verses, I think I can prove my point. And as I tell my classes here in Oklahoma all the time, the main reason I teach is not just for you to learn but for you to teach others. And uh, we're finding that that is coming to fruition in so many areas of the country where people are actually taking what they've learned and using the scriptures and going out and teach others because this is the way it has to work. All right, now in Acts chapter 10, and of course for background, this is when Peter went up to the house of Cornelius. First time that Gentiles have been approached at all and we'll see in another program how even the Lord himself went only to the lost sheep of Israel. But here, Peter has miraculously been led by an act of God up to Caesarea on the Mediterranean seacoast to go to a house of Gentiles. And uh, Peter had a lot of trepidations. You know, I've always put it, if you've heard me in the past, heel prints in the sand all the way from Joppa to Caesarea. He didn't want to go any more than Jonah wanted to go to Nineveh. The same kind of a mindset. Well, those are Gentiles. God, you don't have anything to do with Gentiles. But God says, Peter, get going. Get going. All right, now when he got there, here's where you see that the circumcision is Jewish. The uncircumcision are Gentiles. All right, verse 44 of Acts chapter 10. And that's all I'm trying to show here is the definition of these two words. And while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all them who heard the word, and they of the circumcision who believed. Now, in order to find out who was in there of the circumcision other than Peter, you jump across the page, at least in my Bible, to chapter 11, verse 12, where it says, And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren who accompanied me and we entered into the man's house. Well, who were the six brethren? Well, they were Jews that had come with Peter from Joppa to Caesarea. I mean, Peter was just in no mood to go to a house of a pagan Gentile by himself. So I guess for spiritual protection or whatever, he took these six Jewish believers with him, and so there were seven, of course. All right, now back to chapter 10, verse 45. And so they of the circumcision who believed were astonished. In other words, Peter and these six other Jews. So what are they called? Of the circumcision, see? 
they of the circumcision were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the, now what's the word? Gentiles. That on the Gentiles was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now come all the way down to verse, or chapter 11, verse 1. Now this is after the fact. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea, now that means at Jerusalem, where, of course, the core of the early church was located. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they who were of the circumcision, who? Jews, see? And so they who were of the circumcision, the Jewish believers at Jerusalem, contended with him. Why? Next verse. And they said, you went into men, what's the next word? Uncircumcised. What were they called up in chapter 10? Gentiles, see? Now that's all I'm trying to show. The Jew over and over in Scripture is referred to as the circumcision. The Gentile, on the other hand, is referred to over and over as the uncircumcision. We refer to them as Jew and Gentile. But they're the same, see? All right, now then if you'll come back to Ephesians chapter 2, I hope I've made my point. It's just a matter of definition that when we speak of the circumcision, it's the Jew, it's Israel. When we speak of uncircumcision, it's the non-Jew. And that's all I put on it. A non-Jew. Anyone who was not born out of the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the 12 tribes of Israel, regardless of whether they're Oriental or whether they're African or whether they're European or American or whatever, if they're a non-Jew, they're a Gentile. And they are referred to in the Scripture then as the uncircumcision. All right, now back to Ephesians chapter 2, and we probably won't finish everything that's in verse 12 in this half hour, but uh, that doesn't matter. Now verse 12. He writes to these Gentiles, he's writing to you and I to remember where we'd come from, and now he tells us what the situation was concerning our Gentile forefathers. Now, of course, we're another 2,000 years almost removed from when Paul wrote, but nevertheless, as we look back through human history, it's still the same. And so at that time, well, what time? when God was only dealing with the covenant people of Israel. Now I guess maybe it's as good a time as any to put it on the board. I should have probably put my timeline up and uh, been more uh, equipped to keep it straight because usually I can't do it when I draw it without any help. But you want to remember that from the time of the call of Abram, and we've had this on the board over and over and over over the years, 2,000 years B.C., when God pulled off of this mainstream of humanity, He pulled off what we now call the nation of Israel by virtue of the Abrahamic covenant. And we'll be looking at that probably in the next half hour again. And so we always refer to it as the period of time of Jew only, but of course there were exceptions. As I've already referred to Jonah, went to the city of Nineveh and uh, Rahab on the wall of Jericho, and Ruth out of Moab, and so forth. But by and large, all the way from Genesis 12, 2000 B.C., it's all God dealing with Israel, and not a Gentile, with these exceptions. Now, as we finally came to Christ's earthly ministry then, it really was pointed out that God was only dealing with the nation of Israel. Now, if he is only dealing with Israel, where does that leave the Gentile? Go well, read on. See? Read on. That at that time, from 2000 BC until Paul is sent to the Gentiles, you as Gentiles were without Christ. Now, we don't have the word Christ in the Old Testament, but what is it? Messiah, see? The Messiah. And so he says, you Gentiles, for 
those 2,000 years that God was dealing only with Israel, you were without a Messiah. No hope of a Messiah. They were never promised a Messiah. All right, read on. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Now, if you're an alien, what are you? You're a non-citizen. You don't have any rights. Now, you take today. Even with the laxity that we're showing toward immigrants, basically, according to our laws and our Constitution, how many rights does an alien have? None. He, by right of law, has no, no reason to expect governmental help. He can't vote. He's a non-citizen. All right, now this was the lot of the Gentile all during this 2,000 year period of time, with these exceptions. Now, I don't want to have anybody come at me and say, well, what about Nineveh? Well, that was an exception. But the rest of the Gentile world were out there in their pagan darkness, worshiping all their idols of gold and silver and wood and what have you. And then, of course, came the mythological gods and goddesses of uh, Egypt and uh, Greece and Rome. But it was all tied to that same concept of many gods and goddesses, which began, of course, at the Tower of Babel. That was the lot of the Gentile world. Only Israel had a knowledge and a contact with and a belief in the one true God. And this is what we have to understand before the scriptures open up and begin to make sense. All right, now read on in this verse 12. So not only were we without a Messiah. Now when I say we, I'm talking about our Gentile forefathers. Not only were they aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, they were strangers to the covenants of what? Promise. Now we always like to talk about the point that as soon as God began to deal with Abraham, in fact let's go look at it. We'll have to look at it again later anyway, but come back to Genesis 12. And, and you'll see why Paul uses the word, the promises. That the Gentiles were outside the covenants of promise. Genesis chapter 12, starting at verse 2. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. And I'll give you time to find it because we know that people all over the country in their kitchens and in their living rooms are finding it while you are. All right, in Genesis chapter 12, dropping down to verse 2, now just look at the promises. I will make of thee a great nation. God is speaking. What is it? A promise. No way that Abraham could see how, but God's going to make of him a great nation. That's a promise. All right, move on. I will bless thee. He didn't say, I'm blessing thee. He said, I will bless thee. Well, if he hasn't got it in hand, then what is it? It's a promise. Somewhere down the road, it's going to come to fruition. All right, read on. I'll make your name great. Hadn't yet. Abraham was no different than anyone else in Ur of the Chaldees. But the day would come when Abraham would be a name of renown. See, I will make your name great. Thou shalt be a blessing. Future tense. Hadn't happened yet. So then what is it? It's a promise. Promise, promise, promise. See? And then the greatest one of all is in verse 3, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him who curseth thee. Why? Because through this man to whom all the promises were given would come the Redeemer for the whole human race. Not just for Israel, although that will come first, but it's going to end up being the plan of salvation for the whole human race. But it began with Abraham. See, and that's why I'm always reminding folks, you take our Bible from cover to cover. Who wrote it? Sons of Abraham. See? That's what we can call Jews. The sons of Abraham wrote this book to the last man. And I'm seeing more and more proof every day from various articles and writers that even the one that a lot of people try to say is a Gentile, he was no Gentile at all, and that was Luke, the physician. 
He was, not a, he was not a Gentile. He was a Jew, but although he had taken on a Gentile name, so did Saul of Tarsus. So that wasn't unusual. Saul was his Jewish name, but once he got out into the ministry, his name was changed to Paul, which was a Roman name. But he was a Jew. All right, in the same way with Luke. So I still stand on the premise that this whole book came through the sons of Abraham, through Jews, see? All right, now then, the promises come back to Ephesians 2 once again. And so the Gentiles, during this 2,000 years before Christ, when God was dealing only with His covenant people, the non-Jewish world were strangers from the covenants of promise. Now this sounds awful. I mean, this just sounds as though God was cruel and unforgiving. No, that wasn't the case at all. Because you see, for the first 2,000 years from out here at the creation of Adam, all the way past the flood, past the Tower of Babel, and up until the call of Abraham, the whole human race had opportunity for salvation. The whole human race had access to God. It wasn't just one group of people. And what did the whole human race do with it? Well, they rejected it. And if you don't believe me, you'll certainly all believe the account of the flood. And I think there were probably four or five billion people on the earth at the time of the flood. And how many were true believers? Eight. Eight. Now we think we're getting pretty small in percentage today, but listen, we're not that far yet. It may get to that, but I hope not. But nevertheless, that's what happened that first 2,000 years of human history when the whole human race had access to God and salvation, but they walked it underfoot. They didn't care. And it's getting to be the same way today. Most people don't care. They have absolutely no interest in the things of the Spirit. Why? Because it's always been that way. When people say, well, things aren't much different, I agree. <laughs> it has. It's always been this way. But all right, now they were without hope, and they were without who? God. They had no knowledge whatsoever of the one true creator God. They had no concept of him. All they had were their gods and their goddesses and their temples and what have you. But so far as the true God of creation, there wasn't a Gentile that knew anything of him whatsoever. And so this was the lot then of the whole non-Jewish world up until we get into the book of Acts. Now let's go back and look at it, and that'll almost be an introduction then for our next half hour. Go to the book of Acts, and I guess I'm going to start first in chapter 11, <clears throat> because a lot of times I think people have a hard time believing me when I say that Christ in his earthly ministry had nothing to do with Gentiles, with two exceptions. The Canaanite woman and the Roman centurion, those are the only Gentiles in Scripture that Jesus had anything to do with, and that's all we can go by. I know a lot of people try to say that uh, Galilee was Gentile, and since he performed so many of his miracles, he must have done it on behalf of Gentiles, but the book never says that. Our book says that they were only Jews that he dealt with. All right, now as you come into the book of Acts, and this is a recap, of course, of everything that took place when they were stoning Stephen, which I maintain is about seven years after Pentecost. And now in Acts chapter 11 and verse 19, seven years after Pentecost, and they who were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenix and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the Word, and you want to remember there's no New Testament yet, not a word of New Testament, so what are they preaching? Old Testament. Now who in the world had the Old Testament? Not the Gentiles, the Jews. All right, but now read on. They went everywhere preaching the Old Testament to none but Jew only. See how plain that is? 
How can anybody, well, I know they do. I had a gentleman the other day tried to show a friend of his something and showed it to him in the scripture. And the guy read it, looked him in the eye and said, but I don't believe that. <laughs> and he says, in other words, you're calling God a liar. Well, he said, I don't care. I don't believe that. Well, isn't it sad? But see, there's multitudes of men with buku degrees behind their names that just literally would say, I don't believe that. That Jesus ministered to Gentiles and Peter ministered to Gentiles. But our Bible says that all the way up until the stoning of Stephen, they ministered to none but Jew only. And that's when I started using the term. When I saw this verse years and years ago, that it was Jew only only. All right, now, how did that come about? That it changed. Now back up, if you will, to Saul's conversion in chapter 9. we got to do this quickly. The half hour's gone. Back to Acts chapter 9. And I'm not going to go through all the ramifications of Saul's conversion. I haven't got time for it, but I'll drop all the way down to verse 15, where it's a recap written by Luke, of course, of Saul's conversion and what happened? Now, while Saul is meeting the Lord on the road outside Damascus, God, of course, is dealing with Ananias inside the city. And so to Ananias, the Lord said in verse 15 now, Go thy way, for he, this most feared Jew from Jerusalem, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Now, if you want to see what the Jews thought of Gentiles, turn over quickly. we got one minute. Turn over quickly to Acts 22. And Paul has now been out amongst the Gentile world establishing little congregations. He's back in Jerusalem, and he's trying to explain to his Jewish listeners what God had been doing through him. And he says in verse 18 now of Acts 22 that the Lord spoke to him while he was in a trance and said, Make haste, get thee quickly out of Jerusalem. And then you come on over to verse 21. As he comes to the end of his dissertation, he says, And the Lord said to me, Depart, that is, out of Jerusalem, for I will send thee far hence to what people? The Gentiles. And goodness sakes, what does the next verse say? They listened to him until that word, and then they lifted up their voice and said, Away. Thank you for watching with Through the man. Bible with Les Felden, Isn't that amazing? a weekly Bible study. If you would like more information about the Les Feldick Ministries, a Bible study in your area, or about this program, write to Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760. Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. That's Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Through the Bible with Les Feldick is viewer supported and your gift is appreciated. Thank you and be sure to tune in next time for Through the Bible with Les Feldick.